Gemara Shabbos asks, my Hanukkah, for what Nais did Chazal set up the Yom Tov of Hanukkah? Says the Gemara, because the Yavonim entered the Heichal, they destroyed, defiled everything there. And many years later, when the Hashemunai vanquished, when the Hashemunai family destroyed the Yavonim soldiers, they re-entered the base of Mikdash, and all they could find was a small flask of oil. That oil should have lasted one evening, it lasted eight evenings. L'shona Acheres, in a different years, <coughs> years later, Chazal <coughs> set this up as the days of Halal, and the Gemara is very carefully, Yom Tovim Bahala Vahoda, a day's <coughs> Yom Tov set aside specifically for Halal Vahoda, for praise and thanksgiving. The Bach makes an observation, there is no mitzvah to have a Suda on Hanukkah, unlike almost every other Yom Tov, where there's specifically an Indian to have a meal, a festive meal, on Hanukkah there is no such Indian. Any meal that we have on Hanukkah is only because it adds additional Pesur Nisa, it spreads it, but there's no actual obligation, there's no actual set concept of having a meal. And the Bach is bothered by why not. And the Bach explains the reason why not is because the entire destruction the salvation, and everything that occurred had very little to do with physicality. It was completely, utterly spiritual. And the Bach says these words. He says, The reason why Hashem sent the Avonim to destroy the base of Mikdash and to stop the Avoda was because because the Konim became lackadaisical in Avoda. The single reason why the Avonim were allowed to enter the base of Mikdash was because the Konim lost their fervor, lost their energy, their zeal when they were doing the Avoda. Therefore Hashem said, it's time to stop the service in the base of Mikdash. And the Bach explains that when the clients all recognized their loss, and then they did tshuva, they recognized how important the Avoda was, they were willing to be most nefesh, they were willing to give up their life. Hashem sent the Chashmonoim who were all Konim. It was only appropriate that the Konim be the leaders of this battle. And therefore it is, says the Bach, that there is no Suda, because everything involved Avodah Shebelev. The Avodah in the base of Mikdash was stopped because the Konim didn't do it with enough energy. The willingness of the Jewish nation to sacrifice their life to bring back the Avodah. And in the final end, everything had to do with the things of Avodah. Therefore, Chazal said, Behala Vahodah. Hala Vahodah, praise and thanksgiving, are service from the heart. That is the appropriate way of commemorating the events that occurred. And that's how the Bach explains why we don't have a special Indian of a Sa'uda, why we don't have a meal. And if you think about this Bach, I believe it's very difficult to understand for one simple reason. What the Bach is telling us is the underpinnings, the entire fundamental issue, the reason why Hashem felt it was proper to stop the avoid the racing dish was because the Kohanim got lazy. Now, I don't know exactly how you define this Rashlu, but it means a certain lack of fervor, a certain lack of zeal. But at the end of the day, is that so severe that you stop the entire avod in the base of Mikdash? Is that so severe that you say, let's stop it and maybe never start it again? It doesn't quite seem to fit what's being described. But if we focus on a little bit of the historical relevance, historical time period, I think we'll see that the question on the Bach becomes much more deep and much more fundamental. And to do this, I'd like to borrow a little bit from a previous Shmuz, for those who remember Shmuz number 15, Hanukkah God fights our wars. I'd like to borrow a little of the historical perspective to understand why this Bach is very difficult to understand. And to do this, let me preface with one point. For the, his, for the history of the time periods, we have a number of sources. There are two Megillahs, one of which Rav Haigon says was written by the sons of Matas And we also have, we have various sections of the Gemara, we have Josephus. And even though the Megillahs were never accepted into Tanakh, they have some real veracity. So we do have an understanding of the time period. And let me begin with, again, just a very quick outline, a very quick sketch of what occurred. In 168, the Common Era, on the 25th of Kislev, Antiochus entered the city of Yerushalayim, and the very first thing he did was he killed 40,000 Jews, took 40,000 as slaves, he marched into the base of Mikdush, he took a chazir, he took a pig, and he imitated the avoda. These people were very sophisticated. He was fully aware of what was done in the base of Mikdush, and he did every step. He did the shechita, Kabbalah's dam, Zrika's dam, all of the steps that are done with the korban, he did with a pig to mock the Jews. 
he took a zona, brought her into the Kachi Kachim, on top of the Sefer Torah, performed a sin, and very quickly the word spread that Judaism, as it was practiced, will no longer be. Now you're much aware of the fact that the initial decrees were against Chodesh, Shabbos, and Mila. People say that the word Chashmanoim is actually an acronym, Chasham, from Rosh Chodesh, Shabbos, and Mila, because the initial decrees were exactly against that, against the keeping of Rosh Chodesh, the keeping of Shabbos, and the keeping of Mila. But what a lot of people don't realize is the extent, the severity of the punishment. In Antiochus's dynasty, there was one system of punishment. It was called death. To the extent that the Megillah brings down an interesting story. There was one woman who went up to the Chomosh Yerushalayim. She went up to the walls of Yerushalayim and she called out to Bagris. Bagris was a general in the Yavim army. And she calls out to Bagris and says, You think you've destroyed from our people, Brismila? You have not. At which point she reaches from under her cloak, takes out a baby, takes out a knife, and performs a Brismila. And then she takes that baby and throws it off of the walls of Yerushalayim to its death. And then she proceeds to follow, she throws herself down. And the reason was quite simple. Because the punishment for giving a bris to your child was they would take the child and hang it around the mother's neck. Then they would hang the mother and the baby up to sit there while the birds of prey would eat the flesh off the bones. Very quickly you did not give your child a bris in your shalayim. And it spread from Yerushalayim to the other cities. And very shortly thereafter, if you wanted to keep Shabbos, Rosh Chodesh, or Mila, you could not be in the populated cities. But that was the beginning. Once the armies took hold, once the edicts became much more enforced, and then they began spreading. It was no longer just Shabbos, Rosh Chodesh, or Mila, but it was everything else. What that means in plain, simple language was any vestige of Judaism was punished by death. To the extent that if a Yovim soldier accosted you in the street and asked you of what nationality are you, and you answered you were Jewish, you were summarily slaughtered on the spot. Very quickly, this Chutzot Yishalayim, the streets of Yishalayim will be reft of Jews. Anyone who is Torah loyalist fled to the cave, fled to the outskirts. And you could not keep Torah and be there in the cities. As an illustration of how bleak the situation was, and one of the Megillahs tells us that at the very end, Yehuda sends a message. At the very end, when they won the war, Yehuda sent a message, we have Sifrei Torah, send your Sofrim. Because throughout the width and breadth of Eretz Yisrael, you could not find the Sefer Torah. They had burnt them all, and keep in mind, in those days, in those days we learnt literally from the Sefer Torah, they had burnt them all, there was nothing left to the extent that Yehuda, at the end of the war, sends out messengers, we have Sifrei Torah, come get them. The Ramban in Chumash says very clearly, if it weren't for the Chashmanoim, the Shtachacha Torah mi Yisrael, Torah would have been forgotten from Yisrael. And here's the question. And what the Bach is telling us is that the cause of all of this, the Seba, the reason why all this came to be, says the Bach, is because Nishrashlu HaKonim Ba'avoda. The Konim were lazy in their Avoda. It doesn't seem that the punishment fits the crime. Because what the Ramban and Chumash is telling us is that what we're dealing with here is the destruction of Judaism. In plain language, any connection to Torah, to mitzvahs, was to be eradicated. But if you understand what that means, that means that Jews would be eradicated as well. The only way the Klai Yisrael is kept alive is via Torah Mitzvahs. The only way the world itself is kept alive is through the Kedusha of learning, through the Kedusha of Mitzvahs. What that means in plain language is, the world was slated to end. And I guess the question is, it sure doesn't seem that the punishment fits the crime. Let's grant that the Kohanim should have had more zrizis, more alacrity, more zeal when they were doing their service in the base of Mikdash. There was something amiss, something lacking, but that doesn't sound like a reason to destroy the entire world. And what makes this even worse is another interesting perspective. And that is that Lahore it would seem that there were far bigger fish to fry than the Kohanim not serving properly in the base of Mikdash. Amongst us were very, very real traitors, very real enemies of state, and people who turned 100% diametrically against Torah observance. And to illustrate that, I'd like to share with you one observation. There is no discussion, not in the Megillahs, not in the Gemara, not in Josephus, as to how it is that Antiochus penetrated the cities. Yerushalayim is on a har, is a mountain. 
surrounding Yerushalayim are impenetrable walls. Throughout history, Yerushalayim was considered the type of fortified city that could not be conquered. If it weren't for specific nisim, overt miracles, that God allowed the walls to be broken down, they never would have been broken down, because they were powerful, fortified, and easily protected. Yet amazingly, there's no discussion of a siege, there's no discussion of a breaking down of the walls, Antiochus just walks into the city. And I'd like to address the how and the why behind that. <clears throat> During this time period, there were many Mishavnim. A Mishavnim is a Hellenist, a Jew, who was more Greek than the Greek. A Jew who looked at the Greek Syrian culture as progressive, as the way to be. These people set their entire focus on getting the Greek Syrian culture into the Jewish nation. They were propagating, they were spreading. They wanted to save the Jews from this archaic way called Judaism. Not only were they powerful, they were extraordinarily influential. One of the Megillahs tells us that they opened a base mishak in Yerushalayim. A base mishak we think of as a gymnasium. A base mishak in Greek Syrian culture was not simply a gymnasium. A base mishak there was a place of serving the various idols, Jupiter, Zeus, and the various Apollo, the various different gods that they would serve there. It also served as a place where you practice the games, the various sports, but it was a seat of culture, a seat of the Greek way of life. They opened a base mishak in Yerushalayim before Antiochus attacked the city. And the Megillah explains to us how it is that they opened this <coughs> base mishak. The Jews of Yerushalayim sent a bribe to Antiochus. You see, for many years they had begged Antiochus to open just such a base mishak in Yerushalayim, and Antiochus flatly refused. He recognized it would lead to a tremendous civil war. It would be akin to putting a mosque today in Bnei Brak. There would be tremendous revolutions. He didn't dare risk it. They sent a bribe of 130 talents of silver. A talent is approximately 50 pounds. They sent this bribe to Antiochus. When Antiochus got this bribe, it was enough money to seduce him, enough money to pay for the 3,000 soldiers that were necessary to surround this base mishak to protect it. And in fact, the cause, the reason it was established, was because the Jews in Yerushalayim and the Mishyavnim joined forces with the Greek Syrians. They tried to introduce this. They asked for this base mishak to be opened in Yerushalayim. According to some, the way that Antiochus entered the city was not by siege, not by force. The Mishyavnim, the Hellenist Jews, opened the gates for their Savior. Come in, save us from these Torah loyalists, and protect us from their ways. And here is the question. Clearly, there were many Mishyavnim. There were many Jews who were more Greek than the Greeks, many Jews who practiced openly, practiced Avodah Zorah. During one of the battles, and when Nicanor landed to fight against Yehuda, one of the Yavim soldiers, Nicanor, landed in Eretzrol, he landed with 40,000 cavalry. Yet when he mounted the actual war against Yehuda, he shows up at the battle with 60,000 cavalry. Where did the 20,000 come from? Primarily from the Shavnim, Jews who were joining the ranks of the Hellenists. So here's the second question on the Bach. If we're dealing with many, many Jews who have so lost their focus, so lost their matora, their reason for existence, that they've joined the enemy, wouldn't you imagine that that would be the reason why Hashem would allow the Yavonim to enter the base of Mikdash? The Bach tells us the single cause was the Kohanim being lazy in the Avoda. Now let's grant there's something wrong with that. Let's grant that that's some issue. But it sure does sound like the thousands and thousands of Nisyavnim <clears throat> thousands of Jews who are more Greek than the Greeks is more of an issue, more of a danger, more of a reason for Hashem to allow the Mishab, the Yavonim to enter the base of Migdish and stop the Avoda than the Kohanim being lazy. So the first question is, it doesn't sound like the punishment fits the crime. You don't cease the Jewish nation from existing because the Kohanim are lazy. <clears throat> and the second problem is that there seems to be a bigger reason, namely the Mishab. And I'd like to see if this evening we can answer these two questions and understand what in fact the Bach means. And to do that, I'd like to share with you an interesting perspective. The next time you go to a Shiva house, especially if it's a very, very difficult Shiva house, imagine you go to a Shiva house and you see a woman and seven children and you recognize that her husband died. 
that is a very unfortunate, very rough situation. And I want you to say to yourself as follows, this should not have happened. A man should not have died at 35 years old, leaving seven orphans and his wife as a widow. It should not have occurred. And the reality is that it was not part of the game plan. When Hashem made Adam, there was not supposed to be a concept called death. Death was not part of the picture, not part of the game, it was not supposed to be. Adam Arishon, when he ate from the Eitzadas, brought Misa onto the world. And here is the thought. The world as we know it isn't supposed to be this way. All the pain, all the suffering, the work, the trials, the tribulations were not supposed to be here. And what it means in plain language is all the suffering over 2,000 years, <clears throat> everything from the Crusades to the Spanish Inquisition to the blood libels, pogroms, persecutions, mass murders, all of it was not supposed to be. One man sins once, and for almost 6,000 years the entire humanity suffers, it sure doesn't seem that the punishment fits the crime. I don't know exactly what the sin of eating from the Eight Sadas was, but it was one man, and the entire mankind suffers so severely for thousands of years, it really doesn't seem to be the appropriate mida kineged mida, measure for measure. And I'd like to see if we can understand this, because this concept is really key and fundamental to understanding the Torah's version of life and the power given to man. And to do this, we need to sort of step away a little bit. Let me take you to a city in Europe, a very interesting city. It's a city that is modern. It's a city that's well-equipped, highways, schools, factories. The only thing missing from the city is people. It currently has a population of zero. Not a soul, not a single human being lives there. And if you look at pictures of the city, it really looks strange because it has everything that a city needs. Water treatment plants, <clears throat> factories, telephone poles, schoolyards. Everything is there except people. The name of the city is Chernobyl. <clears throat> the reason why it's bereft of people is because in 1986 it was the site of the world's worst nuclear disaster in history. What happened was the nuclear power reactor there began leaking and they attempted to stop it and they were successful in encasing it in cement to stop the flow of radiation. But the reality is that a 19 mile area around that center is considered uninhabitable. The Ukraine Ministry of Health estimates that approximately 125,000 people have died from radiation exposure. And right now, today, you, don't, you do not walk in Chernobyl. As a matter of fact, volunteer workers who do occasionally go in wear special, special suits with all types of protection, and their time in the site is measured in minutes. Because of all of the protective gear, it is considered so potent an area that again, you spend but a few minutes. In fact, interestingly, in the center now, there's a model, there's sort of a statue erected of the men who put that encasement, that cement encasement, around the reactor to contain it. All of those men who were so bravely putting the cement up are dead because the amount of radiation that they were exposed to was something that the human being cannot tolerate. <clears throat> okay. What modern man has discovered is something fascinating. That there are powers that exist that the naked eye doesn't see. If you walk the streets of Chernobyl, you will not see anything unusual. You can't detect radiation with your eyes. You can't smell it. You can't feel it. But it's so potent that it will kill. Modern man has discovered that there are many forces, many entities that exist that the naked eye doesn't see. The next time you take a potato and put it into your microwave oven, push the button and a few minutes later, ding, and it comes out fully cooked. I want you to say to yourself, well, fully cooked. There's no fire. There's no flame. Well, how could it be cooked? A hundred years ago, they would have called you Machashefa, witchcraft. There's no flame, no fire. How did it happen? 
Well, it's really quite simple. The microwaves, you see, what the microwaves do is they cause the electrons to spin more quickly. When the electrons in the atoms spin more quickly, that causes friction. The friction causes heat. The heat begins expanding and, bing, cooks your potato. What man has discovered is there's an entire world beneath the surface that the eye doesn't see. And that world is the underpinnings of all of creation. When you release the energy contained in those atomic bomb, in those atomic bonds, you can destroy cities and you can level entire sections of the countryside. I've heard it said that if you take a piece of chalk, if you're able to release all of the energy contained within a piece of chalk, you could heat up the entire Pacific Ocean. But you see, my eye doesn't see it. The difference between the way I view matter and the way a scientist views matter is very different. I see a piece of chalk which is inert, solid, it doesn't change, but a scientist sees electrons spinning around, <clears throat> constant motion, energy, hollow entities with tremendous, tremendous motion. And again, when you learn to tap those energy forces, you do tremendous things. You learn how to microwave popcorn, you learn how to blow up cities, you learn how to release radiation that can kill huge segments of the human population. Those forces are there, they're powerful, and they exist despite the fact that you and I don't see them. As a parallel, Chazal tells us that there is no physical entity that exists without a spiritual counterpart. Just like a piece of wood has an atomic level to it, with electrons spinning around, so too every piece of wood has a spiritual dimension to it, and that spiritual dimension keeps the physical dimension in existence. The only reason why a rock remains, the only reason why anything physical remains, is because the underneath spiritual entity is keeping it in existence. We don't see that. But occasionally we hear Chazal describe it. The way that Chazal described when Yaakov lied down, after he leaves the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, he gathers together 12 stones, puts it as sort of a protective fence around his head, and then in the morning he gets up and takes the single stone, Vayikach me'avni amokum, at night he took the multiple many stones, and when he got up in the morning he took the stone. Rashi is bothered by the contradiction. At night, it said he lied down upon many stones. In the morning, he took one stone. Amar <coughs> Yitzhak, Rashi quotes the Gemara. Each stone was fighting. Each one was saying, Allah yanech tzadik is rosho. Let the tzadik rest his head upon me. Hashem said, fine, we'll make you all into one. The twelve stones became one. Now, gentlemen, the next time you hear a stone speaking to you, check into your local psychiatric ward. Because it's not so common to hear stones talking. But you and I are very, very physical. We relate to a very concrete, very physical wor world, and we don't see the underpinnings. We don't see the Ruchnia's dimension. As we don't see electrons spinning around in atoms, so too we do not see the spiritual entity. We're not attuned to it. We're not focused on it. But that is a reality that exists, and that is a reality that keeps everything physical in existence. And I believe that that's exactly the answer to Adam Rishon. You see, Chazal tell us that when Hashem created Adam Rishon, He said to him as follows, to Medrash. And Medrash said that Hashem took Adam Rishon by the beautiful trees of Gan Eden and said, Tain daitcha. Pay careful attention. Look how beautiful these trees are. Tain daitcha shalohachri valomi. Pay attention not to destroy my world. You see, the spiritual entity of creation is what keeps everything physical in existence. Man was not given the ability to crush stones with his bare hand, but the spiritual underpinnings of the world were put into his hands. He was given the power to either keep the world in existence or to destroy it, not on the physical plane, but by the undergirding, by the bedrock spiritual dimension, he was given the ability to keep the Ruchnius level up or drop it, and effectively what he did with that one sin was destroy the world. You see, mankind doesn't now suffer Misa, death, as a punishment. It's something very different. What Adam Rishon did was ruined the world. When Hashem created the world, He gave the keys of creation to Adam. He said, this is your world. It is dependent upon you. If you accomplish what you should, if you use your time properly, you will be the sustainer of the spiritual elements of the world. The spiritual elements maintains all of physicality. 
What Adam Arishan did by sinning was he destroyed the spiritual underpinnings, therefore the world was radically changed. It's not a punishment. We don't work as a punishment. We don't suffer as a punishment. It's quite different. It's that Adam Arishan changed the very existence of physicality because he changed the underpinnings, the spiritual element, all of physicality changed. And now for history, for all of mankind's history, we live in a very different world. And if you ever wonder about the power given to man, if you ever wonder about the opportunity of man to make a difference, study this one fact. One man, one sin, and the entire mankind lives in a very different world. And I believe that that's also the answer to the Bach. And you see, spirituality is very, very reactive. And much like if you know how to release the atomic bond, you can literally destroy a city. And the spiritual underpinnings of the world are very, very reactive. The nuclear furnace that supplied the spiritual energy of the world was the base of Mikdash. But you have to do the avoda in a very particular way. When the Kohanim became lazy in their avoda, when they were nisrasha, when they became lackadaisical, what happened was that service was no longer pumping out the heavy doses of spirituality that the world needed. If you would look at the base of Migdash, you would see a dynamo, a huge power plant that's supplying all of the nourishment, all of the spiritual energy for the entire world. But when the avoda stopped being done properly, it no longer provided that strength. If the Kohanim were lazy, what that means is they no longer understood what the Avodah did. They no longer understood the centrality of the Beis HaMikdash. They didn't understand how pivotal it was for all of existence. They no longer did the Avodah properly, and the Avodah stopped doing what it should have done. What that means in plain language is the Mishyavnim, the Hellenists, came about because there wasn't enough Ruchnius, enough spirituality in the world. <clears throat> we're one nation, we're one people. If you have this powerful nuclear furnace spewing out levels and level doses of doses of spirituality. And the entire Jewish nation is on a high level. If it's lacking, the Jewish nation itself sinks. As a nation sinks, the tail goes lower and lower. The reason why you had Mishavnim, the reason why you had these Hellenists who are more Greek than the Greeks was because the level of the Jewish nation wasn't there. And it was so severe, so serious, that Hashem said, Kaviochel, it looks like I have to destroy the world. Because the world itself is no longer serving its purpose. And mankind will cease to exist because the center of it all, the spiritual entity, is no longer there. And in fact, I believe that's what the Bach is telling us. That it was because the center core of it all, the basic dish was no longer properly being used, and that everything fell apart. And that's in fact why the entire tshuva had to focus on that. And I think that this concept is actually quite critical for us to understand. Number one, from a Hashkafic standpoint, to understand that there are spiritual nourishment centers and there's a balance to the world. The world is not concrete and physical, but has an entire other dimension to it upon which it rests. But I think there's a much bigger picture to this and a much bigger understanding in two areas. The first is that today, much to our despair, we still don't have a base Mikdash. So you may wonder, what is the dynamo? What is the power plant that supplies the energy to the world? And the answer to that, I believe, is rather obvious. The answer is our yeshivas. If you go to base Medrash Gavoa in Lakewood and you see thousands, thousands upon thousands of young men learning, you're looking at a nuclear reactor spooling forth huge dosages of spirituality. The world is a different world. It's not just Lakewood, New Jersey, and it's not just the East Coast. The world is a different world. If you have the Mir in Yerushalayim, if you have Panovich, if you have yeshivas all over, the yeshivas are exactly that. The nuclear reactor creating huge, huge spiritual changes. You and I don't see it that way. We see a brick building, and we see a shtender and a gemara. But if you have an eye that understands, if you see streets of a modern city that are no longer inhabitable because of radiation overdoses, if you see cities that were leveled, literally taken to the ground by one atomic explosion, you understand that there are forces in the world that are not quite obvious to the human eye, and you understand that there are different things going on, and that is an important obligation upon us to support our yeshivas, to make sure that they're well maintained, to make sure that that which is critical for the existence of mankind is kept up. And that's on a global level. 
But I think there's an application of this concept on a much more personal level that's much more nogeya to each of us. And that is in the following area. <clears throat> Let's say tomorrow morning you get up and you put on tefillin, as many people do in the following way. You put on the first strap, you tie it, and you start... Let me me daven. Does it really matter? Does it really matter whether you daven with kavana or not? Does it really matter whether you put on tzitzit and understand what you're doing? Does it really matter whether you learn properly with a real zeal or not? So typically, how we look at it is, okay, listen, as long as I'm in the ballpark, as long as I'm going through the motions, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm, listen, after all said and done, I'm putting on film, I'm putting on sitters, I eat kosher, I learn <clears throat> kind of every once in a while, whatever, and so I'm, I'm doing all right, like, you know. The Nebuchadnezzar Shechayim explains to us that when Hashem created every single person, Hashem made upper worlds which are absolutely dependent upon that person. We don't see these upper worlds, we don't relate to them, but says in Nefesh Chaim, when I do what's right and what's proper, I give chiyas, I give energy, I maintain, I sustain these upper worlds, and when I do what's improper, I literally take away the energy source, I take away the chiyas, I make it that the upper worlds either become weakened or even destroyed. Now to you and I, it looks like the same act. Alright, a little bit more kavana, a little bit less kavana. And, but the difference in the upper world is difficult to imagine. The difference in the upper world is from literally from darkness to light. It's such a vast and powerful difference that it spells the difference of powerful cities, powerful worlds sustained or the opposite. However, while this concept is interesting, it's very far from us, very removed and very difficult for us to relate to. And I'd like to share with you something that may make it a little bit easier to relate to these concepts. There's a very small tefillah that we say on Rosh Hashanah by Tekiya Shofar. We ask, we say, Hirotzon Hashem, it should be your will that the malach that comes out of the shofar should be old lefanecha, should go in front of you for good. If you pay careful attention to that tefillah, what we're saying is Hashem, and that man is doing the mitzvah of Tekiya Shofar, it's creating a malach. Hashem, allow that malach to do its job. Because I'll tell us that every single action that a human being does, whether it's a mitzvah, whether it's an avera, creates a spiritual entity, creates a malach. At the end of your days, the ones who are made, the ones who testify are those groups and groups and groups of malachim. Every mitzvah creating a malach tov, every avera creating a malach ra. Now, they say that the most electric moment in an athlete's life is when he takes the field on Super Bowl Sunday. I've read that professional athletes say there's nothing in their life that could have prepared them for this moment. You have a man who's so peaked physically, a man who's so ready for the game, they describe when they take the field and you hear a hundred thousand fans cheering. The energy is so electric that after one play they're exhausted, they're wiped out. And their mouth is dry, they can barely stand because there's so much energy that